Described erroneously as the slant on a musique by the Wilhelmina critic Oscar Adolf Hermann Schmitz in 1904, Edwardian Britain was, in fact, a vibrant artistic centre that was home to a string of highly professional composers and a plethora of remarkably gifted virtuosi. Like so many other catchy comments both before and since, Schmidt's disingenuous remark was not only deceptive musically, but damaging historically. Carefully crafted to imply that Britain was better suited to importing musical masterworks than producing its own, the Germans' artistic poison dart was designed to help bring British cultural life to its knees at a time of rising tension between the two countries vying openly with London for economic, industrial and military supremacy in Europe. Berlin was also conscious of the propaganda value of cultural domination. While it is true that the German-speaking countries acted as a powerful artistic magnet for aspiring British musicians throughout much of the 19th century, Britons had begun to find their own compositional voices by the time of Schmidt's aphorism. This was particularly true of the pan-European Frederick Delius, whose music found a welcoming home in Germany the same year that the writer's jibe was published. And while the irony of this probably didn't go unnoticed in Britain, local audiences, musicians and critics continued to be alienated and enthralled in equal measure by the composer's music. But for some artists, the beauty and diversity of his compositions far outweighed their perceived shortcomings. John Barbaroli was one such musician, and not only was he quick to recognise their Britishness and important cultural message, but he was prompt in disseminating them throughout the United Kingdom and around the world. Born and educated in London during the Victorian and Edwardian eras, Barbaroli was a committed interpreter of British music from his earliest years, something of an evangelist when it came to the works of his fellow countrymen. JB, as he was later affectionately known, began his lifelong advocacy of them as a young cello student at the Royal Academy of Music, and first flew the flag for the compositions of his homeland when he performed the opening two movements of Sir Alexander Mackenzie's piano quartet with fellow students at the Academy's Duke's Hall on 18 February 1915. But it wasn't until 12 June 1923 that Barbaroli was able to perform a work by Delius for the first time. The composer's cello sonata with the pianist Harold Craxton at the Aeolian Hall. Then, as a member of the Kutcher Quartet, Barbaroli was involved in performances of the String Quartet in both London and Paris in June and October the following year. Now, of the London performance, the Times critic chirped on 27 June 1924 that, and I quote, This quartet, consisting of Messrs. Kutcher, Whitaker, Rubinstein and Barbaroli, played again at the Aeolian Hall on Monday. They played Franck and Delius and Mozart in C major. We cannot speak too highly of their work, and all three quartets were models of what such things should be, but we are most grateful for the Delius. They did more to let one into the secret of his individual genius than the most chosen words could do. 
They showed us that his shifting harmonics are really composed exclusively of vital melodies and that there are no otious parts. The diffuser method of counterpoint is tightened up till there is no free part at all. It's all pemmican. But the point is to hear this. Hearing is believing. So here then is part of the string quartet arranged for orchestra by Fembi with the Halle Orchestra and Barbara Ollie from 1968. Having revisited the cello sonata with his chum, the pianist and composer Ethel Bartlett, at the Marlborough Centre for the British Music Society on 17 March 1924, Barbara Lee then performed the work again with his friend at the Wigmore Hall on 9 December 1925. Now sadly, the first of the two recitals seems to have flown under the critics' radar. But of the second, the Times reported on 12 December that for their recital of sonatas for violoncello and piano at the Wigmore Hall on Wednesday night, Mr. John Barbaroli and Ms. Ethel Bartlett had chosen four works of different character, but all of musical value. After Bach in G, they jumped the centuries to Debussy and Delius. The latter work is something of a speciality with these two artists, and in the serenade, they obtained a fine open air feeling. While in the final section of Delius's work, which is in single movement fantasy form, they enliven the thick harmonic texture of the composer by their appreciation of its underlying rhythm. By the time of the 1925 recital, Barbaroli had already attracted attention as a conductor for the Marlborough based Guild of Singers and Players. Now founded in 1921 by the bass John Goss, 
The Guild performed at a number of inner London venues and had attracted 434 members by 1925, rising to 525 the following year. Now, already secure in its audience base by 1924, the Guild decided to allow the young Barbarolli the chance to conduct a series of concerts with a small string orchestra that he had formed at his own expense. Now, along with the music of Mozart, Debussy, Vivaldi and Tartini, Barbarolli gave works by Hughes, Purcell, Warlock and, of course, Delius. Now, combining high technical standards with intimacy and novelty, these concerts attracted a large and devoted audience. Now, while bo healthy box office receipts were always welcome, some supporters were concerned there was a danger that the concert's defining qualities might be sacrificed on the pyre of commercial gain. Now, the Times recognised this on 26 January 1925, and after hearing a programme that contained the premiere of Warlock's Serenade, a work composed in celebration of Delius' 60th birthday, its critic was quick to caution that... It would be an odd fate for a series of concerts to be destroyed by its own success. Yet, the Guild of Singers and Players will have to watch that their subscription concerts are not driven by increasing audiences from the intimacy of the room at the courthouse Malibon into the more frigid atmosphere of the ordinary concert hall. When these concerts were resumed on Friday, there was a full house to hear a delightful programme. Mr. John Barbarolli got from the Guild Chamber Orchestra a tone that was both keen and clean, and a kind of contrapuntal regard for the inner parts which made the whole thing pulse with life. A new serenade for strings by Peter Warlock was played for the first time, and proved to have a number of qualities which works in modern idiom do not always show in combination. It is an adequate vehicle for the expression of the qualities of warmth, serenity, contemplativeness and happiness, which ought to belong to a birthday present for Frederick Delius, which is what this work is. So here then is part of Warlock's Serenade with the National Gramophonic Society Chamber Orchestra under Barbarolli from 1927. Barbarolli's commitment to Delius's music was soon obvious. 
thanks to a complete programme of the composer's works that he gave with his small band on the BBC on 30 January 1925. Now, a little more than four months after that broadcast, the new Chanel galleries opened in the King's Road, Chelsea. A stylish combination of exhibition spaces and performance areas, the galleries was a multi-purpose venue that not only displayed the plastic and visual arts, but also promoted concerts. Overseen by a music committee that included Eugene Goossens, Peter Warlock, John Ireland, E.J. Murren, Ralph Vaughan Williams and John Goss, the gallery's distinctive concert series needed an equally distinctive performance vehicle to deliver its artistic message. Now, impressed by Barbarolli's work with the Guild of Singers and Players, Goss knew that the young maestro was the right man for the job, and so the Chanel Chamber Orchestra was formed. Now, with its vibrant art scene, its sophisticated and well-educated audiences, Chelsea provided Barbarolli and his players with a unique opportunity to explore their interest in all things new and unfamiliar. Surrounded by paintings, etchings, sculptures and drawings by some of Britain's most celebrated contemporary artists, JB's dynamic ensemble soon became known for its interesting programs and its exacting musicianship. The young band thrilled its audiences with works by Warlock, Elgar, Holst, Goosens, Bax, John Cooper, Gibbons, Purcell and again Delius given with a flair and commitment that quickly captured the attention and the admiration of the musical press, Barbarolli's performances at the galleries were seen as an exciting alternative to the more traditional fair on offer at some of London's larger venues. But as remarkable as these surely were, tempting the capital's conservative audiences away from Portland Place and Kensington Gore, to hear works like those by Delius was far from easy. And even after two years of successful music making in Chelsea, the Musical Times felt the need to write on 1 March 1927 that, having heard within five days the Chanel Chamber Orchestra and another four times its size, I pronounce for the Chanel. Perhaps this is mere anti-jumboism, a disease as mischievous as its opposite. Whatever the complaint that fostered it, there was utmost enjoyment for one listener at the Chanel Gallery. Everything was matched in size and quality. The orchestra, the conductor, Mr John Barbarolli, and the hall being small and excellent. There was not a fault to find anywhere, either in the interpretation or in the playing of this select and musicianly little orchestra. It is said that these concerts are endangered by public neglect. Chelsea, no doubt, does its bit, but London is to blame. Let the Musical Times offer its advice to those about to go to a concert. Chanel Galleries, King's Road, is just accessible as the Albert Hall. No more, no less. Over the next few years, Barbarolli's young band of virtuosi played under a number of names, including the National Gramophonic Society Chamber Orchestra. Now, founded in 1923 by the novelist, critic and creator of the Gramophone magazine, Compton Mackenzie, the National Gramophonic Society produced recordings of works that were either new or had been neglected by some of the bigger companies. So it was unsurprising then that when Mackenzie invited Barbarolli to make his recording debut as a conductor with the Society at the Vocalion Studios on 3 January 1927, Warlock's Serenade and Delius's Summer Night on the River were amongst the first works to be documented. Now, writing in the Daily Telegraph on 9 April, Robin Legg reported that aside from Corelli's famous Christmas concerto. The other three works are modern, the Deux Danses, Danse Sacre and Danse Profane of Claude Debussy, Delius's Summer Night on the River, and Peter Warlock's Serenade for Strings, written in honor of Delius's 60th birthday. In each case, the playing of the orchestra, conducted by John Barbarolli, seems to me to be faultless, but great care will have to be taken in the choice of needles, especially in a work so subtle and exquisite as the Delius. I shall look forward to more such recordings made under the aegis of a society so single-minded as this. Here then, 
is part of Summer Night on the River with the National Gramophonic Society Chamber Orchestra from 1927 with Barbara Ali. Now, within two weeks of the recording that we just heard, Barbara Lee gave his first performance of On Hearing the First Cuckoo in Spring with his chamber orchestra at the New Chanel Galleries on 18 January 1927, a reading that was broadcast by the BBC. Now, the following month, the young conductor was again joined by his chum, Ethel Bartlett, uh, for another performance of Delius's cello sonata at Reading for the local music club, a program that also included cello sonatas by Debussy, and Brahms, and that was repeated for the Violin Cello Club at 10 Nottingham Place, London, on 9 June 1928. Now, having begun to find his feet as a conductor with his chamber orchestra, Barbaroli reached a particularly important milestone in his career when he performed a work by Delius for the first time with a major London Symphony Orchestra. Now, for his debut as a conductor with the prestigious Royal Philharmonic Society at the Queen's Hall on 17 January 1929, he gave the composer's cello concerto with the Russian cellist Alexander Bayansky in a program that also contained works by Vivaldi, Haydn and Debussy. 
Now, even though Bajanski was engaged by the society as a direct result of Dies' personal recommendation and had given the first performance of the work at Vienna in 1923, his reading of the concerto did little to impress the critics. Now, when reporting on the concert the next day, the Times correspondent was quick to alert the paper's readers to Bajanski's uneven rendering of the piece, while being equally quick to trumpet Barbaroli's very obvious abilities as a conductor. The Royal Philharmonic Society entrusted its fourth concert, given at the Queen's Hall last night, to Mr John Barbaroli, a young conductor who began to make his mark at some concerts at Chelsea a few years ago and has since been working with the BNOC, the British National Opera Company. In a program a little shorter than the average, but alternating old and new styles, he got the results from the players which justified the society's confidence in him. The two classics, Vivaldi and Haydn, were separated by Delius's cello concerto, the solo part played by Monsieur Alexander Bajansky. The beauty of Delius's work, apart from the sensuous beauty of sound, which is inescapable, lies in a mood of aloofness towards his own ideas. He ruminates over them, dismisses one for another, and again recalls an earlier one, not so much for balance of design, or even for the pleasure of recollection, as for further consideration. To gush over his melodies as they appear is to reduce the work to a cloying mass of sentimentality, and Monsieur Bajansky's portamenti were too often like scoops of a second-rate singer reveling in popular hymn. He is, no doubt, a very able instrumentalist, but this is not the way we want to hear Delius played. Well, as a virtuoso cellist himself, Barbaroli must have raised a sceptical eyebrow or two during Bajansky's reading of the work, a piece that most definitely appealed to his own artistic sensibilities. Now, when reflecting on the performance some years later, J.B. recalled that, and I quote, Bajansky played the almost unplayable original version, and although he was a very fine cellist and a revered artist, he had the fastest vibrato I think I have ever heard." Unquote. Well, Barbaroli was able to set the Delian record straight five months later, however, when he documented a song before sunrise with the new symphony orchestra. Made for his master's voice on 7 June 1929, the discs were welcomed critically and were considered a valuable addition to the composer's growing discography. Now, writing as K.K. in the October 1929 issue of the Gramophone, W.R. Anderson felt that the beginning of the last named piece, A Song Before Sunrise, perhaps epitomises, as well as anything, the Delius spirit. In the song, I feel a trifle of over-urgency, but that may be just the conductor's idea of the music's rising joy. Still, I prefer a gentler effervescence here. On the whole, electrical recording is inclined to emphasise some elements in Delius that slightly put the music out of balance. For the fine clarity of these records, we are particularly grateful. Here then is part of a song before sunrise with the new symphony orchestra and Barbaroli from 1929. <laughs>
On 8 November 1930, Barbara Ollie performed with the Scottish Orchestra for the first time as a guest conductor. Now, amongst the works that he gave that night at Glasgow's St Andrew's Hall was On Hearing the First Cuckoo in Spring, which he repeated with the orchestra at Edinburgh's Usher Hall two nights later. Now, of the first of the two performances, the Scotsman reported on 11 November that... In Delius's On Hearing the First Cuckoo in Spring, Mr. Barbaroli showed himself equally at home in dealing with the most delicate impressionism as with the exquisite formalism of the piece." Unquote. Now that Barbaroli then conducted the Scottish band again on 17 November at the Usher Hall, and again Delius's music was on the programme. Now, of his reading of In a Summer Garden that night, the critic for the Scotsman opined the following day, and I quote, The young British conductor gave Delius In a Summer Garden with great delicacy and with a refinement of phrasing which preserved a clear vocal line in the rather elusivo melodic contents of the work. Here, then, is part of In a Summer Garden with the Halle Orchestra from 1968. Now, after performing Brig Fair with the Orchestra of the Royal Philharmonic Society at the Queen's Hall and in the Summer Garden for a broadcast with the BBC Studio Symphony Orchestra on 29 January and 20 December 1931 respectively, Barbara Raleigh returned to the Scottish Orchestra as its music director in 1933. Now, unlike many of the other orchestras in Britain at the time, the Scottish orchestra not only employed women, but continued to use instruments that were soon to be antiquated within the United Kingdom. Now, until the 1930s, British orchestras used piston valve, French-made French pawns, French bassoons and gut strings. Now, the lighter sounds that French instruments made and the earthier qualities that gut strings produced stand in sharp contrast to the effects that modern instruments create today and was part of the sound world that Delius knew and composed for. 
Now, first heard in the United Kingdom as a direct consequence of Henry J. Wood's adoption of lower continental pitch, A440, in 1895, Fred's instruments would continue to be used until Sir Thomas Beecham and the London Philharmonic Orchestra began to employ German horns and German bassoons in 1932. Now, for a promotional film of the orchestra's launch that year, it's clear that at least one of the four horn players and at least one of the two bassoonists used a French instrument for their reading of the last movement of Tchaikovsky's Third Symphony. Here, then, is that launch with Sir Thomas Beecham conducting part of that symphony. Other orchestras may, for the moment, be more famous and their names more familiar to you. That, I venture to say, is only because this is a new orchestra and the others are older. For my part, I have no doubt, having conducted many orchestras, that this, an English body of players, is much the best that has ever been under my baton. Within weeks of taking up his post as music director in Scotland, Barbarotti reasserted his credentials as a Delian with a performance of On Hearing the First Cuckoo in Spring at the Usher Hall on 9 January 1933. Now, three days later, he made his debut as a guest conductor with the Halle Orchestra with, amongst other things, Inner Summer Garden. Now, reviewed as something of an afterthought by the Manchester Guardian's critic on 13 January, it was felt that, and I quote, the delicate melting tones of Delius were in strange contrast with all the other music, Purcell Suite for Strings, Mozart's 40th Symphony, and Frank's Symphony in D minor. But the orchestra, finely directed, subdued itself appropriately to the exotic murmurings of Inner Summer Garden. Well, when Barbaroli returned to Scotland later that year, his passion for Delius' music took flight, resulting in a further 22 performances of 11 works with his Caledonian band. Now, new to his repertoire were The Suite from Hassan, The Walk to the Paradise Garden, Fantastic Dance, Eventyr, North Country Sketches, The Violin Concerto with Albert Sammons, Der Aquarelles, and The Two Pieces for String Orchestra. Of Barbarolli's reading of the suite from Hassan at St Andrew's Hall on 16 November 1933, the Scotsman commented two days later that the sixth popular concert of the Scottish Orchestra was given at St Andrew's Hall, Glasgow on Saturday night. In spite of miserable weather, the audience was well up on the improved average of this season. In the second half, which was broadcast, a first performance at these concerts was given of Delius' suite from Hassan. Mr. Barbaroli intimated that the suite could not be performed entirely, as part of the score had not been obtained. He also mentioned that he had received a letter from the composer, who would probably listen in to the performance in his home in France. The suite is typical of the composer's colourful writings and was well received. Here then, is the intermezzo from Hassan with Barbaroli and the Halle Orchestra from 1968.
The most substantial piece by Delius that Barbara Ollie gave in Scotland was a violin concerto with the renowned British violinist Albert Sammons, the work's dedicatee and first interpreter. Heard on 1 February 1937 at the Usher Hall and the following night at St Andrews Hall, the concerto was new to the orchestra, but not to Scottish audiences, as it had been given previously at the semi-professional Reed concerts. Consequently, the Scotsman did little more than acknowledge Barbara Ollie's first performance of the work, and on 2 February noted simply that, and I quote, the Delius concerto with a vague charm of the solo part set against the richness of the orchestral background was given with an understanding which missed no point of elusive beauty and there were many recalls for Mr. Sammons at its conclusion. Adamant that British works should be heard within an international context, Barbara Ollie nearly always presented Delius's compositions alongside established continental masterpieces at his Scottish concerts. The exceptions to that rule occurred on 19 and 20 November 1934, when he conducted an all-English program that comprised solely of works by Elgar, Delius and Holst. All three had died earlier that year, and all three had appeared in JB's programs from near the beginning of his career. Left artistically bereft by the loss of three of Britain's greatest creative minds, Barbara Ollie must have felt that he was witnessing the end of an era. The conductor's sense of loss was shared by the local press and was expressed poignantly when the critic for the Scotsman wrote on 20 November that, it is probably an unexampled catastrophe that a country should lose three of its greatest musical personalities within rather less than five months. Elgar died in February of this year, Holst in May, and Delius in June. Elgar was 77, but he had the completion of his third symphony well within his grasp. Delius was 71 and a confirmed invalid, but it was by no means impossible that he might not yet have produced other works. Holst was 60, which nowadays counts as almost young. Two of these men were of foreign ancestry, Delius and Holst. But in spirit and in its musical expression, not one of the three was less English than the others. Delius's tone poem, Eventyr, one of the two works by which the composer was represented in the program, had not been heard in Edinburgh before. It is music which is full of the elusive charm of Delius, and in it, as in the familiar on hearing the first cuckoo, Mr. Barbaroli realised in the happiest way the peculiar beauty of the music. Here then is part of on hearing the first cuckoo in spring, with the Halle Orchestra and Barbara Ollie from 1956.
By the time Barbaroli replaced Arturo Toscanini as music director of the New York Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra in 1937, Delius's music was already familiar to Knickerbocker audiences. Now, following Walter Damrosch's reading of Brig Fair on 6 November 1910, the orchestra gave a further 53 performances of 14 works under nine conductors before Barbaroli made his American debut as a Delian with on hearing the first cuckoo in spring on 12 December 1936. Now, having been given on at least 12 earlier occasions by the orchestra, the work was by far the most often performed piece by Delius in New York. And it was probably for that very reason that it was largely overlooked by the local critics at that concert, who spent most of their time reporting on the conductor's approaches to the works of Beethoven, Weber, Mendelssohn and Respighi. Over the next six years, Barbaroli then proceeded to give one performance of the Violin Concerto with John Crigliano Violin, two each of Brig Fair and the Dance Rhapsody No. 1, three each of A Song of Summer and Appalachia, four each of the Intermezzo from Fenimore and Goethe and On Hearing the First Cuckoo in Spring, five of the Prelude to Ermelin, seven of the Walk to the Paradise Garden, and nine of the Intermezzo and Serenade from Hassan. This is by far the greatest number of performances given by any one conductor of Delius's works with the then all-male New York Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra. Now, of the 10 pieces by Delius that Barbaroli gave with the band, five were local premieres, the Prelude to Ermelin, Appalachia, the Violin Concerto, the Intermezzo for Fenimore and Goethe, and the Song of Summer. And two were new to Barbaroli's personal repertoire, Appalachia and the Prelude to Ermelin. Here then is the Prelude to Ermelin with the Halle Orchestra from 1956, and of course with John Barbaroli. Now, of the works by Delius that Barbaroli gave with the New York Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra, the two most substantial were Appalachia and the Violin Concerto. Now, programmed alongside Clark's Trumpet Voluntary and scenes from Wagner's Parsifal, Appalachia was heard on 13, 14 and 17 April 1938 and was dubbed, and I quote, Delius's Swamp Opus, unquote, by the New York Post's headline writers. But despite its American connections, or perhaps because of them, the piece made a dismal impression on the paper's critic Samuel Totsinoff, who pilloried it on 15 
April. He said, the novelty on the program of the Philharmonic Symphony concert Wednesday afternoon and last night was Frederick Delius's variations on an old slave song, Appalachia, for orchestra with final chorus to give it its full title. The work was completed in 1902, though it was conceived some years before when Delius was an orange planter in Florida. It is most interesting to see the deep impression that America made on Delius. The composition, however, is feeble. Except for a slow introduction of melancholy cast, which is characteristically Delius in its poetic suggestiveness, the rest of the work is insipid in invention and quite unimaginative in treatment. The variations might have been constructed by a first year student in composition. They are so obviously inexpert. Nor are the choral passages a credit to the composer, who could write so beautifully for voices in his mass of life. Mr. Barbaroli accomplished his patriotic duty in presenting the variations, but it is doubtful if he added anything thus worthwhile to the repertory of the orchestra." Unquote. And what are the New York Times' impression of the piece? Well, the usually skeptical Olin Downs was more forgiving of Appalachia than Chotsonoff, but was still far from convinced by the composer's music. Now on 15 April, Downs wrote, and I quote, in part the score is tenuous and here and there superfluous, but this defect, serious as it is from the standpoint of concision and balance of form, does not deprive us of the utterance of a true tone poet and artist to whom nature has revealed something of her mystery. The orchestration is wholly characteristic of the composer, as truly as the music is compounded of quest and dream. It is fairly certain that little Delius produced will stand on its own feet for a very long period as great art. Nevertheless, in his scores are the things of a rare mind and spirit, a personality which speaks to us through the song and which carries that song to greater significances that a strict logician might appreciate. For Delius, is of the royal company of the poets who perceived wonder, new pain, and consumed themselves in the service of their faith. Here then is a variation from Appalachia with John Barbaroli and the Halle Orchestra from 1970.
When the New York Times came to review the violin concerto, almost exactly a year after Barbarolli's three performances of Appalachia, the response of its critic was again far from positive. Writing on 2 April 1939, the day after Barbarolli's first and only reading of the concerto in the five boroughs, the Times correspondent reported that, Although the Delius work is played without a pause, a theorist can find in it three main divisions and enough adherence to textbook rules to justify its title of concerto. Nonetheless, the pragmatic listener will call this music atmospheric, feeling, that is, that despite broad changes of tempo, there is one predominant mood and colour, and a decided lack of that dramatic development which should be the chief characteristic of any work in sonata form. In this instance, the mood is contemplative and lyric, which makes the definition of form by contrast even more difficult to perceive. Add to it the typical softness of Delius's harmonies and melodies, and the result is something which the non-British mind will receive with nothing more positive than tolerance. The New York Tribune's critic's response to the work was equally unenthusiastic, and on 2 April he said, and I quote, Frederick Delius's violin concerto had its first performance by the Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra under John Barbarolli's direction in last night's concert of the Popular Price Student Series in Carnegie Hall with John Grigliano, assistant concertmaster, as the soloist. According to impressions at a first hearing, the concerto is characteristic of one of the most individual and imaginative figures in the recent history of British music, creating a desire for further acquaintance and at the same time suggesting reasons why it has waited long for a New York hearing. With a relatively informal but far from formless structure and appealing themes, often similar in character to those in his works which are more familiar here, the work has much imaginativeness and poetic meditative beauty. The solo violin sings a seldom interrupted song which was set forth with lyric expressiveness in Mr. Corigliano's laudable performance. The orchestration is masterful while eschewing vivid instrumental hues. There is, however, a certain lack of necessary contrast, too much similarity of general mood, colour and tempo in relation to the length of the work. The themes themselves do not make for an effect of sufficient variety. Further acquaintance indeed might modify impressions such as these. The orchestra gave its colleague praiseworthy cooperation. Put simply, the New York press thought that Delius was a composer with a unique and imaginative musical voice, but one which lacked structure and formal direction. The local critics had no doubt that Barbarelli had done his best by Delius and that Corigliano and the orchestra were supportive of the conductor's interest in his fellow countrymen. The further acquaintance that the Tribune's critics suggested might be necessary in coming to terms with the violin concerto never eventuated. For it, like Appalachia, A Song of Summer, Brig Fair, Dance Rhapsody No. 1, The Intermezzo and Serenade from Hassan, and The Intermezzo from Fenimore and Gerda, all fell from the Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra's repertoire when Barbarolli left New York and have not been played since. Here then is part of the violin concerto with John Crigliano and the Houston Symphony Orchestra under John Barbarolli from 1968.
Well, when Bob Rolly was appointed permanent conductor of Manchester's Halley Orchestra in 1943, his interest in Delius' music went into overdrive. Hoping to be no longer handicapped by the critical scepticism of an antipathetic press, or to be hampered by a local public with little interest in the composer's music, JB programmed and recorded his hero's music on a regular basis. Now, after conducting his first concert with his new orchestra at the Princess Theatre Bradford on 8 July 1943, he then performed the Prelude to Ermelin in the composer's hometown the next day, before giving a Song of Summer ten days later at the Usher Hall, Edinburgh. Now, of the Caledonian concert, the critic for the Scotsman wrote on 20 July that... The Delius music recalled a remark by Richter about a work of somewhat similar character. There appears to be more in this music than is indicated in the score, or words to that effect. Music of the Delius type demands in a special degree imagination and sympathy from an interpreter if its full intention is to be realised. Mr Barbaroli was wonderfully successful in his suggestion of the music's drowsy charm. Here then is part of A Song of Summer with the Halle Orchestra from 1966. But it was not until 30 April 1944 that Barbaroli was able to perform a work by Delius in Manchester for the first time as the city's new permanent conductor. Now that night he gave a song of summer in the cavernous King's Hall Bellevue, a venue better suited to wrestling matches and circus acts than symphonic concerts. By the time of that event, JB and the Halle had already given 29 performances of six works by Delius in 19 cities across the north of England and Scotland. As selected pieces from the composer's oeuvre had quickly become an important part of their joint performance aesthetic, it's somewhat baffling that the Manchester Guardian's response to the King's Hall concert should be so cursory. Reporting on 1 May, the paper's critic wrote both enigmatically and simply that extraneous influences affected the course of the Delius work, but it was played with a delicacy and finesse that brought particularly good results in the closing sections. 
It was also during Barbaroli's first regional tour with the Halle Orchestra that he added a new and substantial piece to his Delian repertoire, the Concerto for Violin and Cello. Dismissed by Sir Thomas Beecham as being in need of a, and I quote, fairly ruthless revision, unquote, if it were ever to be, and I quote again, saved from oblivion, unquote, the concerto was first given by Barbaroli at the City Hall Sheffield on 22 October 1943, before being heard again at the Eastbrook Hall Bradford and at the Longford Cinema Stratford on the 24th and 25th of the month. These were the first of seven performances that JB gave to the work with Lawrence Turner violin and Hayden Rogerson cello in cities that also included Edinburgh, Oxford, Reading and London. Now of their last performance of the concerto at the Royal Albert Hall on 11 May 1946, the Times critic took a dismal view of both the work and its reading and grumbled two days later that Delius's double concerto, which is not often heard, was played by the leaders of the violins and cellos, Messrs. Lawrence Turner and Hayden Rogerson. It is doubtful whether the work could be made to sound like a concerto even in the hands of more aggressive players, for its continuous rhapsody has no beginning and no end, only an interminable middle. In a darkened hall, why make the Albert Hall gloomier than it is in any case bound to be on a May afternoon? The formless reverie of Delius was even more melancholy than the composer intended it to be. Doubtless, the double concerto was received equally unenthusiastically by the press at its other outings. But this did little to dissuade Barbaroli from championing Delius' concertos in general, and on 1 February 1945, he gave the piano concerto for the first time with Robert Forbes and the Halle at the Philharmonic Hall, Liverpool. Now this was the first of five readings of the piece that he gave with the orchestra and the pianist at Manchester, Birmingham, Sheffield and Harrogate. Now of the Mancunian performance on 31 January 1945, the Manchester Guardian's critic reported on the following day that another deeply emotional work in the program was the early piano concerto of Delius. Here, Mr. R.J. Forbes reaped a well-deserved success as he has done on previous occasions by his finely assured and imaginative playing of the solo. But at times, the orchestral parts were allowed an energy that blotted out some ornamental figures for the piano. Figures that are more interesting than those that are unaccompanied. Depth of character are not missing in the work, but it has not the felicity of utterance that we associate with the composer. A work by Delius that we now equate more closely with Sir Thomas Beecham than Sir John Barbaroli is Paris, the song of a great city. Now, as the son of a French mother, it might be assumed that Barbaroli would have been drawn immediately to the work, but that was not the case. And it wasn't until 13 December 1952 that he gave his first performance of the Nocturne at the City Hall Sheffield with the Halle Orchestra. Then, some three months later, he gave two further readings of it at the Free Trade Hall Manchester on 11 and 12 March 1953, before allowing it to fall from his repertoire. Now, aside from the double concerto and the piano concerto, this was the only other substantial work by the composer that Barbaroli gave for the first time during his Halle period. Now, of the initial Free Trade Hall concert, the Manchester Guardian's critic was again less than impressed by the work and noted briefly that the remaining work on the program was Delius's Paris, the Song of a Great City, which although still strongly Wagnerian, contains some of his best and the most original music, but it is painfully uneven in quality. Although Barbarolli was active throughout his career as a guest conductor, he largely confined his activities to his Mancunian band during his period as its permanent conductor. There were some exceptions, however, such as when he conducted the Vienna Philharmonic at the Festspielhaus Salzburg on 20 August 1947. 
Now at that concert, he gave the walk to the Paradise Garden, a work that he also performed with the Queensland Symphony Orchestra at the City Hall, Brisbane, on 20 January 1951. But after accepting the less time-consuming role of conductor-in-chief of the Halle Orchestra in 1958, he increased his activities as a guest artist substantially. Now that year, Barbara Olley returned to North America for the first time since 1943 for an extensive tour that was nothing short of a festival of British music. With a repertoire that included eight works by six of his compatriots, Barbara Olley started his trip in Winnipeg on 4 December before moving on to Detroit, New York, Boston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Vancouver. Now in the Big Apple, he gave 20 performances of seven works by six British composers at 16 concerts at the beginning of the new year. Now missing from that repertoire was Delius's music, a result, no doubt, of the Knickerbocker critics' ongoing antipathy towards the composer's works. Although clearly fed up with walking into that particular dialectical brick wall, JB was not prepared to throw in the Delian towel completely during the tour and braved the local ire of the press by giving the walk to the Paradise Garden with the more receptive Winnipeg and Boston Symphony Orchestras. Here then is part of the walk to the Paradise Garden with the Boston Symphony Orchestra from 1959.
Along with his work with the Halle Orchestra during the last decades of his life, Barbarolli was a regular guest conductor with the Berlin Philharmonic, was the music director of the Houston Symphony Orchestra, and was a recording artist for HMV and Pi. While he only conducted a handful of the composer's works with the Texan and Berlin ensembles, he did document 19 of Delius's pieces with the Halle between 16 November 1944 and 17 July 1970. And it was with the last of those sessions, which took place a mere three weeks before his death, that Barbaroli brought his activities as a recording artist to an end by putting the finishing touches to Appalachia with the baritone Alan Jenkins and the Ambrosian singers. At that final session, Barbarolli created a career-spanning discographic arc that started and concluded with the music of Delius. With the sole exception of Sir Thomas Beecham, no other artist did more for the composer than Barbarolli, and no other conductor disseminated his music more widely. From the staggering 684 readings of Delius's works that J.B. gave on five continents, it's clear that his championing of the composer's oeuvre was not only a labour of love, but a statement of all that he held dear artistically and culturally. As the alpha and omega of Barbarelli's activities in both the concert hall and the recording studio, Delius's music was an important artistic thread that wove its way through JB's professional life. A life that was made all the richer thanks to the continuing presence of Britain's most enigmatic and personal composer.